stay there. Okay, ready? Oh, good morning, everybody. Thank you. So, um, this is kind of um, a very difficult way to start the year with the flooding, all that sort of stuff, but obviously, those of you who are able to attend today, we certainly appreciate you coming to hear our, our speaker. So we are very happy to start the year by welcoming Steve Bowler. Okay. Steve is an educational thought leader, a former superintendent of schools, a principal, an author, and a school culture and motivation expert. He's known for his quick wit, creative thought, and humorous personality, and we got ample evidence of that before, <laughs> before we started today. Um, this awesome combination of in-depth experience has allowed him to be one of the premier educational motivational speakers and consultants that is available. Steve Bowler's alter ego is Stan Tall Steve. Stan Tall Steve openly shares his knowledge, experiences, and creativity with others. He currently speaks to students, staff, and communities throughout the country about how to work differently, about schools, education, and life. Husband of one, father of three, owner of two dogs and 10 fish, ladies and gentlemen, Stan Tall Steve. Good morning, everyone. And not since I'm way up here, I'm going to take this off. I think you're more than six feet away from me, all right? So let's go through some basic things that I know that uh, you, you probably have in your mind. Because I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Six foot seven, all right? <laughs> Size 14 shoe. No, I am not a professional basketball player. Yes, I can play basketball. No, I will not do it for you. Yes, I could dunk the ball. No, I will not do it for you. Yes, I played basketball in high school. No, I did not play basketball in college. Yes, I enjoyed the sport. No, I do not know any professional basketball players, okay? <laughs> Those are the questions I get everywhere I go, no matter who I see. Why? I'm a walking stereotype. Six foot seven, black man, bald head, gotta be a ball player. It's okay, I'm used to it. I get it everywhere that I go. No matter who I see, do you play basketball? Do you play basketball? Do you play basketball? I say, no, I'm really into miniature golf. You know, <laughs> me and that windmill, we're real good at that. So it's okay, it, it's, a, it's a good thing with my height being as tall as I am, and, and it's something that I'd live with most of my life. Now, no matter where I go to speak, and I speak all over the country, and, and pre-pandemic all over the world, um, I always take about five to 10 minutes on the front end of my speech and I do a public service announcement for the world of tall people. Uh, I do this because I'm sure you have seen them wandering around amongst you, and you may have had questions about tall people, but you've never asked. So just bear with me, this is something I always do because I feel that it's my job since I'm representing the world of tall people. So there are things that are absolutely wonderful about being tall and some things that are not so great about being tall. Let's start with the things that are not so great about being tall. Number one thing, cars. Yeah, cars. See, you guys are lucky. You can get any kind of car you want, go anywhere you want. It's easy, it's fine. Doesn't work that way for me. You know, I can't just jump into any kind of vehicle easily. The, um, what do you call those things? The uh, Fiats, Minis, those smart cars, those are cool, right? Yeah, no, they're terrible little death traps. I hate them. I gotta fold up like origami in order to fit inside of one of those things. So cars don't work for the world of tall people. Another thing not so great about being tall, airplanes. Yeah, airplanes. You think you have no leg room in an airplane, I have no leg room in an airplane. Whenever I get on a plane, what do I do? I start to pray as soon as I get on a plane. And I don't pray that the plane stays in the air. I pray, please don't lean the seat back. Please don't lean the seat back. Please don't lean the seat back. And what do they do every time? Lean the seat back right into my legs. And then on top of that, being on a plane, you guys have the wonderful, comfortable headrest. You know, it bumps out just enough to be comfortable. Well, that's in my back, all right? So I'm, I'm no, not comfortable, it's stuck in my back, no leg room. I've seen the, the flight attendant comes by. Are you comfortable? Does it look like I'm comfortable? You know, I just got off the no-fly list, a little issue before the pandemic, but we're fine now, we're good. So cars are no good, airplanes are no good. Clothing, trying to find clothing. So you guys can go to any store you want, go do what you need. Now, I know what you're thinking again. What about the big and tall men shops? That's why they have clothing just for you guys. But for some reason, they think you have to be big and tall. So I get a shirt and it's like a moo moo. It's like all this extra girth around me. So air, cars, airplanes, clothing, shoes, 
doorways, ceiling fans, spider webs. These are all major issues in the world of tall people. Yes, spider webs. You go on a hike, put your tall friend in front. Like, oh, you know, you have issues all the time. So those are the things that are not so great about being tall. Now, on the other side, there's some things that are absolutely fabulous about being tall. Number one thing for me specifically, random autographs. People think I'm famous. They think I'm a ball player. I get it all the time. And do you know where it happens the most? Airports, believe it or not, airports. Why? When you go to an airport, what do you do? You people watch, you're watching people. So I don't, I stand out. People feel empowered to come right up and ask who I am, where I play and all those things. It happens all over the world. Real quick story for you. Way back when I um, got married, years and years and years ago, at the time my wife worked in the travel industry. So we were very fortunate. We, our honeymoon, we went to the country of Greece. Country of Greece. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, Athens, all the Greek islands and everything. Well, the national sport in Greece is soccer, or football as they say. But a very, very, very close second is what do you think? Basketball. I did not know this. You think I look like a ball player now? You should have saw me in my early 20s, right? So I get to Athens, and they're not shy. Everyone kept coming up to me saying, you NBA, you NBA, you NBA, thinking I was in the NBA. They love U.S. basketball. I kept telling them, no, no, no. My wife said, idiot, yes. I said, I am? Yes, you're NBA all day. I said, oh, okay. You NBA? Yes. What team? Timberwolves. Nobody knows who's on the Timberwolves. I got free drinks, free meals, free tickets. It was wonderful. I was a celebrity. We took a little trip around the Greek islands. We went to this one island called Mykonos. Beautiful, beautiful island. We ate at a wonderful little cafe on the eastern side, right next to the water, windmills in the distance. It was beautiful. I guarantee you, if you go to that cafe right now, there's a picture of me and the owner like this. He thought I was famous. I got a free shrimp cocktail. It was great. So everybody thinks I'm famous, automatic uh, signatures all the time. The other great thing about being tall, I can get all this stuff off the top of the shelves in the grocery store. Some of y'all can't do that, right? And when, when I'm going in the grocery store, I make sure you little people aren't down the aisle because what's going to happen when I go down there? Can you help me, right? And everything. I'll tell you what, lady's not afraid of a big black guy when she wants to get that rice off the top of the shelf. She'll come right out. Can you help me? And I'm like, I'm, I'm nice. I always help, right? I'm like, here you go. And then she's like, ah, you know. No, no, I don't do that. I don't, I don't. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I do. You know, ask me again, girl. Ask me again. See what happens. No. So I could get stuff off the top of the shelves, signatures in a concert, pre-pandemic, but in a concert, I can have perfect view every time. So there's some good things and some not so good things about being tall. So there's my public service announcement to you about the world of tall people. Now, let me give you a little bit of a history about me. Growing up, to become a tall person, I didn't want it. I didn't like it. I actually fought it. Eighth grade was the year that everything went nuts for me. At the beginning of eighth grade, I was five foot eight. At the end of eighth grade, I was six foot three. Five eight to six three. Now this isn't one calendar year, this is one school year. From the first day of school to the last day of school, I grew from five foot eight to six foot three. It was extremely painful. It hurt. You wanna talk about growing pains? I had them. I was 13 years old, I wore size 13 shoe at the time. You wanna see a comedy show? Watch me walk up some steps. I constantly was tripping over myself. My ankles hurt, my feet hurt, my knees hurt. My back hurt. That's when my back problem started. I've had three back surgeries since. It was, it was at nighttime, I could literally feel myself growing, waking up with cramps constantly. I didn't know if I should stretch out, I should ball up. I, I, it, it, was, it was so bad. On top of these physical immediate pains that I had, I also had chest pains. Like my heart hurt. It came out of nowhere and it was extreme. I'd be walking in the hallways or I'd be in class and all of a sudden it felt like my heart was cramping and it hurt and I would double over, I would fall to the ground. The nurse would come, teachers would come. It would last for like 10 seconds, maybe 15. But then I'd be in the nurse's office being watched the remainder of the day and it would happen two times a day, three times a day, constantly throughout my eighth grade year. 
It got so bad that my parents eventually took me to a, um, a specialized children's hospital, Alfred I. DuPont Hospital in Delaware. I'm a Jersey guy, by the way, South Jersey, so I'm with you guys. So we go to Alfred I. DuPont Children's Hospital. They're doing tests on me. They're trying to figure things out. Ultimately, they realized that my bones were growing faster than my muscles and my ligaments. And ultimately, they had that. I started getting steroid shots two to three times a week. And they put something on me called a Hultra monitor. Now, for those who don't know what a Hultra monitor is, it's these sticky things they put all on your chest, and then these wires go down into this bag, and it reads your heart throughout the day to make sure your heart is catching up. And they wanted to measure it when I had these attacks. So here I am, I'm in eighth grade, I'm in a lot of pain, my, I'm tripping over my own two feet, my back hurts, my leg hurts, I'm getting these chest pains, and I'm carrying a purse. Because that's what it looked like, a big old brown purse. I don't know if you, you, have anybody ever seen an eighth grade boy in the 80s walking around with a brown purse? That was me. It was a sad sight, really sad. So on top of all of that, I started doing something else. I started to slouch. Have you ever seen somebody with really bad posture? You could tell that they have an image problem or, or they want to shrink away and, and hide from other, everybody else. That was me. I was slouched over. Now, I tried to make it cool, you know, a little dip in my walk. You know, I was a man, but it was very clear what was going on. I didn't like that I was standing out from everybody else around me. It was pathetic. So I grew up in Salem, New Jersey, lower South Jersey, way down there. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Salem at all. In the where I grew up, it was a walking town. Everybody, all the kids walked from school. So I'm walking home from school one day. I'm walking with a good friend of mine. Her name's Danielle. She lived on 7th Street. I lived on 9th Street. So we're walking along. We're getting to 7th Street. And as we get to 7th Street, she says, Steve, stop. I said, stop? Why? She said, just stay there. Okay. She walked around behind me. I'm like, what are you doing? She says, stay there. I was like, all right. She took one hand, put it on my shoulder. She took her other hand, balled it up into a fist, and punched me in the middle of my back. Instantly, I was like, girl, what? I wasn't a very good fighter. So I was like, girl, what, what is wrong with you? What are you doing? And of course, she grabbed my shoulder, punched me in the back. I arched my back. She turned me around. She said, Steve, I can't take this anymore. You're a tall person. Stop trying to be small and stand tall. And that's when it clicked. That's when I realized I wasn't being who I was supposed to be. What in the world is wrong with me? I'm sitting here trying to shrink down and be small, and I'm a tall person. Let me explain something to you. My father, six foot six. My mother, five foot ten. My brother, six foot six. My sister, five foot ten. My father's father, my grandfather, six foot ten. I'm going to be tall. This is happening but I was fighting it. And when she punched me in the back and I stood up straight, I realized, it just came to me, what in the world was wrong with me? So as I left 7th Street and started walking home to 9th Street, I did a lot of thinking. I can see this in my, my mind clear as day. I did a lot of thinking in that short little two block walk. I started to think about myself in school, how people saw me. Now, just so you know, I was the kid that loved school. I loved everything about school. To me, school was the social mecca of all kids my own age who came together every day and they taught me stuff. Are you kidding me? That was just, I loved learning. I was that kid. I was in everything. I was class president. I was in student council. I was in the art club. I was in a band. I was in a jazz band. I was in the debate club. I was in the, 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 the you name it, I was in it. And I wasn't just in it, I was like president, vice president in everything. So when I was walking home from 7th Street to 9th Street, I was thinking about this. I'm like, I'm a leader. What are people looking at? And I'm slouching down and, and hiding out. And, and I realized leaders are not supposed to blend in. They're not supposed to blend in. They're supposed to stand tall. And so I changed the way that I walked. I changed the way that I interacted with people. I changed everything from that moment forward. And throughout my life, I started to look deeply into the world of tall people, the world of leadership. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe that educators 
And education is the last noble profession on earth. It really is. And every single adult that's in a school is a leader. These kids are looking to you, they're watching you, they want to see what it is that you're doing and not doing, and, you, and, and they're, they're emulating you. So over the years, I came up with this stand tall philosophy. My name's Stan Tall Steve. My name's Steve, it's Stan Tall, it rhymes. But I have this stand tall philosophy, and there's three things with it <clears throat> that relates the world of tall people to education and leadership. Number one, tall people, we don't blend in, right? We stand out. If you see a crowd of, tall, a crowd of people, pre-pandemic, <laughs> you see a crowd, you can pick out the tall people right away, right? You can't miss them. They stand out like chiclets. I mean, good grief. Same thing with educators and leaders. You don't blend in. It's not your job to blend in. Real quick, raise a hand. How many of you have ever been somewhere, out and about in the community? You see somebody walking, you hear a word or something that they're saying, and instantly you're like, that's an educator. You can pick them out right away, right? Instantly. They don't blend in. You're not supposed to blend in. The students are looking to you. They're watching you. You're worried about blending in with the rest of the world. That's not your job. Your job is to stand out. Number two, about the world of tall people, leadership and education. Tall people, we have a different view of the world. We see the world completely different. We see where the vision is. We can see where it is to go. Have anybody ever been in a crowd, pre-pandemic, have you ever been in a crowd with a tall friend? What do you do? You push your tall friend to the front, you grab their hand and you say, go. Why? Because they can see. They can see where it is that you need to go. They have the vision. Now here's the thing. When you're in that crowd with that tall friend, and they're helping you get to where you need to go. Is it ever a straight shot? No. They go this way, that way. They go this way, but they get you there. Same thing with leaders in education. We have the vision, we see the end game. We know where the kids need to go. We have that, but is it a straight shot? No, that's last year and a half. If that has not told you it's not a straight shot, nothing will, all right? We go this way, we go that way. We have to make it work, but we'll get there. Third thing, last thing about the world of tall people and education and leadership is, I said it before, tall people, we don't fit. We don't fit. We don't fit in, in, in chairs, cars, airplanes, doorways, all kinds of things. We don't fit. But here's the thing. Even though I don't fit, do I just give up? Do I just say, forget it, I'm not going to get on a plane, I'm not going anywhere, I'm not going to get in a car, I'm not going to go anywhere. No. I make it work. Is it comfortable? No. But guess what? Suck it up, buttercup. Let's go. Same thing with educators and leaders. It doesn't fit. Again, this last year and a half, if this hasn't shown you how it doesn't fit, nothing will. But do we give up? No. Suck it up, buttercup. Let's make this work. And it's not comfortable, but we know how to do it. So that's kind of like my stand tall philosophy. That's what I truly believe about education. In the world of tall people, I'm just trying to educate you about our world, but there's so many things that are connected with it together that really make all the difference in the world. So, I just want to share a few things with you. Is this the one? Whoop, whoop. Make sure I have this thing. I got a red light. Hold on. Whoop, 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 whoop. Oh, there we go. It worked. Woohoo! There we go. Thank you. So I saw this picture and I was thinking about educators. Real quick, raise of hand. Over the last year, has anybody been in this position at all? <laughs> anybody? Oh yeah, like half the world and everybody there is virtually. I'm sure you're like, oh yes. This is a situation that many of us were in. This is not education. This is not what it is I signed up to do. This is not how we do things. It's like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? How are we going to make this work? But the thing is, we did make it work. We did. Click. Things not work clicking for me here. Oh my goodness. Hold on a second. I turned it off and I'm going to turn it back on again. Oh, can you just tap the screen to make it work? Or, oh, okay, we'll do that. I'll just attach this. I'll do it. Okay. I'll be good. Thank you. But here's the thing. We made it work, right? <laughs> even though it was uncomfortable, even though it's not what we expected, we made it work. And you look good doing it, girl. You did it in heels, right? <laughs> Real quick, raise your hands. How many of you, over the last year, ha has learned something? 
something new, a new way of doing things that you can now implement into this new year, right? Oh my goodness, yes. Because here's the thing. I always say you never let a crisis go to waste. You never let a crisis go to waste. Over this last year, we had a crisis. And we don't want crisis to happen. We don't. But I always say you never let it go to waste. You can always learn something. Something can come, come out of it. We don't like it. We're frustrated when it happens. But it allows us to be better. I just grew so many hands in here of people's like, yeah, it was tough. But we learned some new things. I'm sure all of you did too. You learn new ways to connect with students. New ways of using technology. New ways of connecting with parents. New ways of having grace for kids a little bit and allowing them to showcase what it is they know in new and different ways. Remember when this whole thing went down? Whole thing went down, what did they say? Welcome to the new normal, y'all. Oh my goodness, this is the new, this was, that was not normal. I, 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 get, I used to get so upset. I was sitting at home looking at the TV, yelling at it like that. No, this is not the new normal. This is crisis, this is change, this is learning. You know what new normal is? Now. Now begins the new normal. Because all that was a crisis, it was a change. We learned something. You never let a crisis go to waste. Now that we come back this year, we have a whole new set, new set of skills. This begins the new normal. This begins the new normal. This is how this is going to all take place. That's how we learn so much more. So keep that in mind. Now, the talk that we have today, title is gonna be Standing Tall Through It All. Standing Tall Through It All. And I truly believe everybody can stand tall. It doesn't matter if you're four foot two or if you're seven foot eight. You can stand tall in everything that you do. We don't know what the next school year is going to bring forward to us. We don't. But the goal is to stand tall, have that pride, be the one that everyone looks to, right? Have the vision. It's going to be uncomfortable. We're going to make it work and stand tall through anything that comes our way. All right? So are we ready to make this happen? All five of you. Oh, man. This is, who this is going to be good. All right, here we go, right? And, uh, this is going to be exciting, y'all. Here we go. So first thing I want to do is I want to talk about communication and how communication can help us. Now, here's the thing. I know. We're all educators, and in education, I know communication. I teach communication. You know, listen more, talk less, speak clear. But I want to take it a little bit differently, if I may. So I, I mentioned to all of you, eighth grade, crazy year, five foot eight, six foot three, pain in my knees, my back, tripping over myself, halter monitor, purse, slouched over, it was a mess. On top of all of that, my voice was jacked up. I'm talking a little bit jacked up. My voice was toe up from the flow up. I mean, it was bad. It was horrendous. You're talking about that boy going through puberty, voice cracking every other word. So for most of eighth grade, I did whatever I could not to talk. So I was going through eighth grade dealing with this. I had this one class I was in, it was the social studies class. My teacher, his name was Mr. Bond. Now just to get a mental image of what Mr. Bond looks like, he was a very tall and formal man. He walked slowly and he spoke slowly. Um, he looked like um, Abraham Lincoln, going bald, all right, <laughs> with a mustache. That's Mr. Bond. So Mr. Bond, he was old school, straight up old school. He said everyone in straight rows, no grouping, alphabetically all year. And you bet not act up in his class. Now, my last name was Bowler, B. There were no other Bs in that class and no As. I sat in the front row right next to the door. So one day in class, Mr. Bond says, Mr. Bolar, please read the next paragraph. Now remember, my voice was toe up from the flow, flow. She got it right. She said flow up, not floor. All right, no proper English on this one. It was jacked up, flow up, right? So I started with my inner dialogue. This man is crazy if he thinks that I'm going to read anything in front of anybody today. That is not happening. My voice is jacked up. It ain't happening. No. Go ahead, bro. Mr. Bolar, please read the next paragraph. Psst. I don't care what he says. I am not embarrassing myself today. 
he can keep on talking. I'm not even going to look at him. I am not reading anything. Mr. Bolar, is there a problem? If you don't read the next paragraph, you'll be after school with me. All right, we got a problem now. I just got off punishment with my dad. I can't get back in trouble. Now, just so you understand my father, all right? Six foot six, military man, minister from West Virginia. He will give me the right hand of fellowship and the good foot of faith if I get in trouble one more time. Now, I admit, I was class president, I was a good kid, but my older brother and I, we're teenage boys. We got into trouble. We just got off of trouble, so I have to deal with this inner monologue. Okay, all right, this is the problem. I can't get in trouble with my dad again. He will tear me up. I, okay, the paragraph is not that long. I could read this. I could do this. Come on, Steve. Come on, you got this, man. <clears throat> so I picked up the book, <clears throat> cleared my throat. Come on, man, you got this. Remember, voice was toe up from the... Come on, here we go. <clears throat> Today, Mr. Bolar... Okay. <clears throat> Come on, here we go. <sighs> In 1843, I am a guitar, my and it did over me a physician and a and four I read the entire paragraph. <laughs> now, it wasn't that bad. But to me, it was that bad. I sat there with my head down. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, my life is over. I can't believe I just did that. that was, oh, my purse is beeping. Oh, gosh. No, no, no. Oh, man. Now, believe it or not, it was silent in that classroom. Nobody laughed. I knew if I turned around and looked at everyone, they would look at me just like this. Now, I wasn't too worried about most of the ladies in the classroom. I wasn't worried about most of the fellas in the classroom. I was mostly worried about one person, Marcus. Marcus sat in the last row, and he was the biggest bully in school. Marcus stood four foot nothing, <laughs> but he was the biggest bully in school. You can see him in your mind right now, can't you? Can you? Just so you know, he has like a Michael Jackson Jerry curl. It was the 80s, y'all. It was the 80s, all right? It was all right. It was with him. So, again, I begin. Oh, my goodness. Marcus is there. He's going to make so much fun of me. He's going to be busting on me. He's going to, like, stand on top of a chair and then jump on me or something. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. So, I sat there with my head down. Didn't say a word. Now, Mr. Bond, being the great teacher that he was, he just said, thank you, Mr. Bolar, and continued on as if nothing happened. At the end of class, everybody got up, they left. I'm still sitting there with my head down. Mr. Bond calls me over. Mr. Bolar, please come here. I get up, I go over. Yes, Mr. Bond. Why didn't you tell me you had this issue? How was I supposed to tell you? Well, just let me know when it's over. Oh, okay. I turn to go get my things, and who is standing right outside of the door against the locker? Marcus. 100% true story, y'all. I begin again. What am I going to do? Marcus is there. I don't want to run back to Mr. Bond like some chump. Mr. Bond, help me. Wait a second. I'm about 5'10 right now. I could take him. I could do this. So I was like, all right. I go over, I grab my things off my desk, I stand in the doorway. All right, Marcus, what do you want? Marcus does this, pointing to the stairwell. And we all know the beatdown takes place in the stairwell. <sighs> so Marcus does this. I do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I get, I get crack up every time I do that part. Okay, back in character, back in character. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so, 
Marcus is, huh, I'm, yeah, go back and forth a little bit, mild concussion. But eventually my friend Jason, he comes over and he stands next to Marcus. Now you have to understand, Jason is a bigger wuss than I am, but I'm doing the math. Two wusses, one bully, four foot, we got this. So I step in the hallway, all right, Marcus, come on, man, what do you want? Not saying a word, he just goes right to the stairwell. Jason's going to the stairwell. I'm like, oh, here we go. What's about to happen? We go all the way to the bottom of the stairwell in that back corner spot where it doesn't go any further. We're down there. Marcus is there. Jason is there. I'm there. Down there, standing there in silence, looking at each other. Marcus looks around and he says these exact words. I'm glad he picked you and he didn't pick me. His voice is just as jacked up as mine. And Jason's like, yeah, man, I heard all about it. We're like three donkeys down at the bottom of the stairwell. Oh, my goodness. Hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh. We didn't floss, but it felt good. You know what I mean? <laughs> the three of us are actually still friends to this day. Facebook friends, but friends. You know what I'm saying? I like his stuff. They like mine. It's the same thing. But anyway. The whole reason why I told you that story was about the self-talk that took place during that exchange. One of the things that we do, just as humans in general, is we discount the importance of self-talk. What it is that you're saying to yourself. That negative self-talk can pull you back. Throughout all last year, how many times have you said negative talk to yourself? Oh my gosh, I can't do this. This is too you got to be positive. Now, it's good to have a network of friends, a network of people, a department, a, a, a group, a grade level that's there for you, that helps pull you up. But your number one advocate is you. You have to have that positive self-talk. Negative self-talk is just going to pull you down. You talk about standing tall through it all, you won't stand tall through it all with negative self-talk. It won't happen. How many people remember this guy? Anybody remember this guy, right? There you go. Any of our Gen Zers or millennials, just, just say, nod your head. It's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh. But this guy was from Saturday Night Live. I think he's a senator now or something like that. He's like in, in government. But anyway, he had a great little skit. He was called Stuart Smalley. And he would sit there and he would look in the mirror and he would say, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. And we would laugh and just, you know, this guy is too much. But there's something to be said about positive affirmations. There's something to be said about talking to yourself in a positive way. The conversation you have with yourself is 10 times more than any conversation you would have outwardly with anyone else. It has to be purposeful. And a lot of times it happens and you don't even realize what you're saying. Let's look at some questions. Let's look at some questions. Here are four questions that happen within the world of education that we don't even think about. What do you say to yourself when you get to work? How was your weekend? Not long enough. Ugh. <laughs> right? Or, how was your weekend? Not long enough, but we're gonna make this week a great one. Come on, girl, you got this. What do you say to yourself before your students enter the classroom? Oh, he's here today. because he's never absent, ever absent, right? Because truthfully, whenever you have that student, truthfully, all you need to do is make it 1% better each day. That's all you need. If you can make it 1% better each day, how much better will you be by the end of the year? I mean, seriously. Okay, he's here today. Let's do this, I got this. What do you say to yourself when your students leave the classroom? Oh, thank God I made it, oh, jeesh. Oh, I wish I had an hour of my life back. Whew. Whew. Are you saying, okay, that was a tough one. What do I gotta do to get tomorrow better? I can do this. What do you say to yourself when you leave work? Gotta beat the buses. <laughs> Bigger laugh than I anticipated on that one, really. I'll be honest with you, I wasn't expecting that, but anyway. These are moments in the world of education where 
we, the, the, the comments we say to ourselves, they just roll off the tongue and we don't think about it. But those smaller moments are the bigger moments that eventually can help you make it through, to be different, to make it the best year ever. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to shift things just a little bit, if I may. My background is, uh, I'm, I'm a teach, I was a teacher, I was actually, I was an art teacher. I taught art, pre-K to third grade art. That was my first uh, spot. Uh, and yes, I did step on some of the kids. We settled out of court. They are fine. I didn't see them down there. It's okay. Yeah, little tiny people. But anyway, being an educator, I, I like to educate. So as much as I do motivation and I talk and rah, rah, I'm also an educator. So at this point, what I want to do is I kind of give you a lesson. I want to help give you some skills and things that will allow you to get, result, get some results. Because ultimately, isn't that what we want? We want to get results. We want to get some positive outcomes. Not only just from our students, we want to get them from each other. We want a great environment so things go well. So what I want to do is I want to share with you something called the results formula. It's a formula that you can implement directly into your classroom. You can implement it into a department. You can implement it into a school. You can even implement it district-wide. You can implement it into your family and it allows you to move closer to get the results of what you want to see, those positive outcomes, all right? So I'm gonna do a little teaching with you if, I, if, I, if it's okay with you. So this is it. This is the results formula, and it's five letter R's. What you respect, recognize, reward, and reinforce gives you the results. Now here's the thing, before I get to results, there's a little concept I want you to be aware of. It's called reduce, not eliminate. Reduce, not eliminate. A lot of times in education when we have an issue or a problem, what do we do? We get together a committee. And our committee will sit down and we'll talk, we need to eliminate this problem. What can we do to eliminate this problem? Let's go at it. And then when you're unable to eliminate that problem, we're upset. We didn't eliminate it. I'm here to tell you you're not. People are people. Kids are kids. Adults are adults. Emotions are emotions. But what you can do is reduce. The more that you reduce a little bit at a time, now, number one, you're working in a realm of reality. And if you can reduce some of the issues, then you can start increasing the probability of doing what it is that you wanna do, which is teach, right? That's the whole goal. So when we're looking at that, keep in mind, reduce, not eliminate. Now, eventually down the line, if you can eliminate it, wonderful. But we need to work in this sense of reality. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through each one of these things, respect, recognize, reward, and reinforce, get you the results that you want to see. There's a little pointer, a oh, little pointer's not working. All right, so let's go through each one of these. The first one is, <clears throat> what do you respect and value? What do you respect and value? That is probably the most important piece of all of this, clearly identifying it. Now, I was a former principal and superintendent, and I know that most districts have a vision, uh, vision statement or a mission statement. You gotta have that. It's the core of who you are. <clears throat> Although when I've gone to a lot of districts, I ask teachers, can you recite the vision or mission statement verbatim? Not too many people can do that. So I always say you pull out of that vision or mission statement or you get together and you all agree on what it is that you respect and value. Simple, easy words that are easy to remember. Let's pull this down just to the classroom level. At the classroom level, teachers, in your classroom, what do we have? We have, at the beginning of the year, we share our classroom rules, right? We have our rules. We put these rules on a poster on the front of the room. Do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. And then what do we do? We say, okay, these are our rules for this classroom. You know what, you guys are gonna come up to this poster and you're gonna sign this poster. By signing this poster, that means that you're gonna follow these rules. You know what, better yet, <clears throat> we're gonna sign this and I'm gonna print this out. You're gonna keep it in your binder. You're gonna have it in your binder. This is what you're going to do, and it's signed up here. You know what, you're gonna sign the form in your binder, and you're gonna sign the form that says you're gonna follow these rules. You know what, you're gonna take, take that form home. Your parents are gonna sign it, you're gonna sign it, then it's gonna have up here, that means you're gonna follow these rules. You know what, if you take it home and get it signed and bring it back, it'll be a homework grade. You get a homework grade if you sign this form and bring it, you know, we'll make it a quiz grade. You can start off with a 100. Quiz grade, sign the form, sign up here, and you're going to follow these. You know what, we'll make it a test grade. You could start the marking period off with a 100 with a test grade, you sign the form, parents sign the form, bring it, it's been a week, I haven't got the form back. Please bring 
form back. You won't get that 100. It's going to be a 75. Oh, it's been two weeks. You might get 50. Does this ever really work? Because that kid is going to be that kid whether he signs that form or not. Whether his parents sign that form or not. I know adults who sign forms and still do whatever they want. We're dealing with kids. Now, don't get me wrong. You need to have rules in your classroom. You need to have expectations. But I suggest identifying what you respect and value and have that posted in your classroom. In this classroom, we respect integrity, hard work, and teamwork. In this classroom, we respect those things. And then what you do something which I call this internal branding. You internally brand it. I truly believe most of the ideas and the things that we have in schools are great, phenomenal ideas. But they don't go anywhere because we don't take the time to internally brand it. You have a company, any kind of company, pick whatever it is. They have a new product. What do they do when they get a new product? They bring together a marketing team. That marketing team identifies what's the name of it. What's it going to look like? What are the colors? How often are we going to talk about it? Where are we going to talk about it? How long are we going to talk about it? Because why? They're trying to increase the probability of success that people will purchase this product. In school, most of the ideas that I think that we have are great ideas. But what happens is we kick them off, we don't brand it, we don't internally uh, market it, and then February we're like, are we still doing that? Is that still happening? Are we still doing it? All my veteran teachers, honey, I've been teaching for 25 years, it's that way all the time, I know it is. <laughs> Nothing ever stays, right? So when we talk about what you respect and, brand, uh, respect and value, it means something. It should be in the front of the room. It should be on the sides of the room. It should be in the back of the room. It should be in the hallways. It should be in the stairwell. It should be in the bathrooms. It should be during morning announcements, in the email signature. And it should be talked about often because it's that important. And it doesn't have to be long, drawn-out statements. Simple, easy words that we all know what the meaning is. In this school, we are about knowledge and teamwork, fairness, independence, efficiency, effectiveness, right? Accountability, honesty, growth, integrity. You can say any one of these words and everybody knows what that means instantly. And now say pick three, four, look at your vision statement, look at your mission statement, pick those words out, internally brand it everywhere so that everybody knows this is what we're about. So now in your classroom, instead of pointing out kids who are not doing what they're supposed to do, you're highlighting kids who are doing what it is that you respect and value. It's a completely different switch. And they always tell teachers to do what? Walk around the room, right? Constantly move around. So now you're over on this side in the back corner of the room, somebody does what you respect and value. Hey, good job. Awesome job. There, the sign is right there. You point right to it. You're in the hallway. You see some students that's not even your students. Do something you respect and value. Hey, way to go. Point it, it's right there, it's in the hallway. Way to go, that goes what we respect and value here. That's how this works. So the question is this. We ultimately wanna have a great culture and climate. That's what we want. Through what you respect and value, you want the environment to be great. When you move throughout the rest of the school year and on, you want staff to be happy. You want students to be happy. But here's the thing. We always talk about climate and culture, but we never really break down what is the difference between climate and culture. So my question is, what is climate and culture? So what I want to do is I want to break this down for you, if you don't mind. I'm going to break down <clears throat> what climate and culture is, and then I'm going to show you exactly <clears throat> excuse me, what you need to do to manipulate and to work with climate and culture so that the environment maintains a positive outlook all the time. So <clears throat> being the art teacher that I am, I have a diagram. All right, It's my little diagram I created. So let's go through this real quick, if you don't mind. Like I said, I'm an educator. I'm going to teach you something. Smack dab in the middle of this is the word respect and value. Because as I said, that is most important. That is your core. So let's say for the sake of what we're doing here, what you respect and value is teamwork, accountability, and integrity. That's our core. You've internally branded it. It's all over the classroom. It's all over the hallways. We talk about it every morning during announcements. That's what we're about. Teamwork, accountability, and integrity. That's our core. So now what we also have is climate. And climate is represented by that blue wiggly line. And it's represented by a wiggly line because climate is how you feel. It's your emotional state. 
when you walk into the building. And the thing is, climate is fluctuates. Sometimes it's close to what you respect and value. Sometimes it's not. I've been in schools all over this country. There are some schools you walk in the front door and you can feel the negativity the second you walk in. There's some classrooms you walk into and you're like, ooh, what's going on in here? Nobody's saying a word, but you can feel it. In other places, you walk in the front door to school, you're like, oh my goodness, this place is Disney. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful in here. All right? And it fluctuates. <clears throat> climate. The climate of the school during the first day of school is different than the climate before finals. Yes? Yes. The climate before winter break is different than the climate before state testing. Right? Yes. So that's why it fluctuates. It changes day by day, month by month, sometimes hour by hour, minute by minute. Have you ever been in a building where a fight broke out in one side of the building? And then as news and information of that fight spreads through the building, you can feel the change in the environment. That's climate. It fluctuates. So the next thing is is culture. <clears throat> Excuse me. Culture. Now culture, let's define culture. Culture is just a fancy word for Traditions. That's what culture is. Your traditions. What do we traditionally do? You are awesome. I was just thinking, I need some water. Thank you. Halls. He brought me a halls. Oh my gosh. What are you doing after this speech? You know, no. Anyway. <clears throat> so let's talk about culture. Culture is a fancy word for traditions. Traditions. Because traditions are what you routinely do. How do we do things? That's what your culture is. What's our culture? This is how we do things. This is what we do. That makes that up. Now, there's two different types of culture represented by the top gray line and the bottom gray line. There's your operational culture, and then there's your behavioral culture. Your operational culture. Operational culture is how you traditionally operate. How do kids come in a building? How do kids get to class? How do you schedule kids? How do teachers uh, uh, organize things? How do you turn papers in? How do you do, what do you do to organize your building, your school, your district? Traditionally, these are our processes. That's your organizational um, culture. Second kind of culture is your behavioral culture. How do people treat each other traditionally? How do they talk to each other? Better yet, what is tolerated? Right? What is allowed? How do students talk to students? How do students talk to teachers? How do teachers talk to students? How do administrators talk to teachers? How do administrators talk to te students? How do students talk to administrators? How do parents talk to teachers? What is allowed? What is tolerated? What is accepted traditionally in this place? So that's all of our pieces here. Respect and value is our core. What you say, you respect and value. Climate is the feel and it fluctuates. And then we have org operational and organizational climate, uh, culture. Now here's the thing. If your climate is out of whack, morale's low, it's not feeling good around here, you cannot go in and say, we're gonna fix this climate. It doesn't work that way. What you can do is you can work on your culture, what you traditionally do. Your goal is to make sure that your operational culture and your behavioral culture are in alignment with what you respect and value. And when they're in alignment with what you respect and value, those lines move closer. Those lines move closer. And when that happens, what happens to your climate? It levels out. It's still wavy, right? Because climate's climate. People are people. We have emotions. But it levels out. You're not getting those swells of bad feelings all over the place because your operational culture, you're looking at how do we operate? Is this in alignment with, with teamwork, accountability, and integrity? If it's not, let's sit down, let's fix this so that it is. Behaviors, are people acting and behaving with teamwork, accountability, and integrity? And if they're not, are we keeping each other in check? Are we calling each other on it? Are we just allowing everybody else to just let it go? And it's not just the administrator's job, it's everybody's job. If this is what we say we respect and value, this is what we're about, and your buddy is over there mouthing off and not behaving properly and talking to kids the wrong way or whatever, hey, hey, that's not what we're about here. Are you serious? Yeah, I am serious. 
and that moves those lines closer and closer to what it is that you respect and value. This is what we want to see. I don't want to see this. This is when things are not in alignment with what you respect and value. When it is, this is what we get. Does this make sense? Does this make sense? I see a lot of head nods in here. I hope it makes sense to everybody virtually as well. Because for years, no one's ever really explained culture and climate to me. And then what can we do with it? Now, I hate to use this word manipulate, but that's the only word we can use. You can manipulate your culture and climate. So when you have that feeling, staff is saying the morale is low around here, you know what you need to do. You need to look at your operational culture or your behavioral culture. Let's sit back, let's look at it, and let's get it in line. You know exactly what you need to do. Right? That's what I'm saying. I, I like to teach. This is my thing. So, we went over what you respect and value. And I took a little bit extra time on this because it's so important to have that clear understanding of respect and value, how to do it internally branded and how it connects directly with culture and climate. Now the next piece is recognize. We're gonna recognize students and staff when they do what it is you respect and value. You're actually going to do specifically what they respect and value. When you see teamwork, when you see integrity, when you see accountability, you say something. Now when I say recognize, you're, we're not giving anybody anything. No certificates, no tickets, no pencils, nothing. You are opening your mouth and you are saying, way to go, good job, I see you, woohoo, proud of you. That goes with what we respect and value. Your re recognition in this case is taking note when someone does something. Now I know there are people out there that are saying, well, I'm not gonna recognize them for what they're supposed to do. These kids are supposed to come here and learn. I'm supposed to recognize them for that? I'll be like a broken record. I'd rather be a broken record for what they're supposed to do than a broken record talk about what they're not supposed to do. I don't know about you. And here's another concept. Let's, let's do it this way. Big football game, all right? Big football game. Everybody pack the stands. Go to the big game, fill the stands. I know it's COVID, but put your mask on. Fill the stands, right? <laughs> And then for the game, nobody cheer until the end. Sit there silently for the entire game. When the game's over, bravo, good job. Love what you did in the third quarter, that was fabulous. Does that make any sense? No. If that football moves ahead a half an inch, people are like, come on, let's go, you can do it. That football goes backwards a half an inch. Come on, let's make it happen, let's go. But wait. Isn't it what the football, isn't that the football player's job to play football? Why are we cheering for them for what they're supposed to do? Right? But in education, students, that's what they're supposed to do. We're not gonna cheer for them. Football moves ahead a half an inch, we go crazy. Student moves ahead a half an inch, we don't say a word. Football falls back a little bit, we go even crazier. Student falls back a little bit, we don't say a word. And then we wait to the end of the year for an, an awards assembly Bravo, good job, love what you did in the third quarter. Don't get me wrong, I love a good awards assembly, I really do, but why aren't we cheering for them all along the way? I wanna give you a concept, here's a concept, all right? It's called daytime DJ voice, nighttime DJ voice. Daytime DJ voice, nighttime DJ voice. I don't even know if people listen to the radio anymore, but I don't know, I, I do, all right, a little bit. So let's start with, um, let's start with the nighttime DJ. What does the nighttime, late, late, late night DJ, what does that late night DJ sound like? Somebody give me some. What? Bass. Bass, yeah. What else? Relaxed. Somebody said soft. That's right. Relaxed bass. Hey, baby. It's the quiet storm. This is Tony Brown with that sexy sound in your ear, right? Nice and mellow and soft, right? That's our nighttime DJ voice. Now, what about our daytime DJ voice? Better fact, you know what, let's do this. Morning. What's the morning DJ voice sound like? Just say it. Hyped, that's right, what else? Excited, hyped, energetic, over the top, right? That's what we want, daytime DJ voice. Hey, yeah! Oh my goodness, woo, good morning everybody, how you doing? All right, that was three in the morning show, woo, woo, woo. over the top. All right, so we now have the two different voices, nighttime DJ voice and daytime DJ voice. 
when it comes to recognition or just talking to students, sometimes in school, we have it backwards. Student does something they're not supposed to do. Hey, get over here. What are you doing? Look at me. This isn't what it is. You're using your daytime DJ voice for something negative. Student does something they're supposed to do. Good job. You're using your nighttime DJ voice for something positive. Nuh-uh. It's backwards. I don't care if it's pre-K, 12th grade. Kids want to see adults get hyped up. Why are they only seeing adults get hyped up for negative things? Student does what they're supposed to do, specifically what you respect and value. Oh my goodness, way to go. I can see what, that, look at you, that's amazing. Student does something they're not supposed to do. Hey, get over here, let's talk. That's not right. For the negative things, you do it at the lowest emotional level. That's how this works. You wanna see some connectivity from students? Daytime DJ voice, nighttime DJ voice. Now we're also talking about behavioral culture. Other staff members, they're not doing it right. You can go up to them and say, hey, DJ voice, man, what you doing, man? Calm down. Easy, quick, come on. Let me share this with you. I did this presentation about seven or eight years ago. And then right after doing it, I got this instant message, Instagram message um, from a teacher. Now, I know it's kind of small and hard to see, but I'm gonna read it real quick for them, if I don't mind, if you don't mind. Hey Steve, you did a presentation at my school this past Monday. I wanted to take a second and thank you. I have to admit, I was a bit apprehensive when I saw we had a three hour keynote speaker. You were certainly worth the while. <laughs> All right, the thing, that <laughs> the thing that stuck out was hyping the good and downplaying the bad. I'm a physical education teacher and I've always tried to be firm with behavior. Oftentimes that means yelling across the gym at poor behavior. This week I celebrated those who were doing the right thing with the same volume and enthusiasm and it has worked like a charm. I'm happier because the poor behavior stops, the students are happier because they're not getting yelled at and it adds to rather than taking away from an activity. Thank you again. If you take nothing from me today, please take daytime DJ voice, nighttime DJ voice. It's the, if you want to get gains from your students, you want to get results from them, just change up naturally the way you're talking. At home, they're probably getting daytime DJ voice for every negative thing in the world. All of a sudden, they come to school and it's switched. They get the yelled at for the great things, not the negative things. That makes all the difference in the world. Now, I know there are those people out there. No matter what you say, they're like, I have a reputation. I can't do that. I'm not that hype, already rah rah kind of teacher. So here's some nonverbal recognition. You don't have to say a word. Y'all ready for it? Body language. If you can't give a thumbs up and a smile, something's wrong with you. Even behind a mask. My goodness. Show it in your eyes. If students are doing what you respect and value, you have to constantly recognize them for that. Right? It's like almost sometimes we get off on getting at these kids and finding what they're doing wrong. Right? Find out what they're doing right. Show that recognition. Give a thumbs up. Give a fist bump if you can touch them. All right, we talked about recognition. We respect, identify what you respect and value, internally brand it, everywhere, we know how it relates directly to culture and climate, then we're gonna recognize students and staff, you gotta recognize staff as well, each other, when you do what it is that you respect and value. And then the next one is reward. Now when I say reward, yes, we're giving something. This is when we give something. Here's my definition for reward. You recognize students for what they're supposed to do you reward them when they go above and beyond what they're supposed to do. That's the difference. And here's the thing with rewards. I always say no secret rewards. No secret rewards. They should know exactly what they have to do to get the reward. Because if they don't know what they have to do to get the reward, it's one of two things. Either it is a gift or a bribe. And I'm not about bribing kids. But if they know what it is they have to do to get the reward, what is it? They earned it. 
Now it's earned. So much better. And what do I mean by gift? Or a reward, rather. I'm sorry, reward. I call it VTW. Letter V, letter T, letter W. Visible, tangible, walk-aroundable. That's a real word for me. <laughs> Visibly, they can see it. Tangible, they can hold on to it. Walk-aroundable, they can show it off. T-shirts, swag. You know what one of the, the best thing that kids love? It's the best, best award in the world. Pre-K through 12th grade, same thing. Anybody have a clue? It's not food, it's not money. Stickers. Stickers. Kids love stickers. You give them some stickers, they, they lose their mind over stickers, stickers. There's college football, there's college football teams. What do they have, they do with something good on the field, what do they give them? They give them a sticker to put on their helmet. Those guys will kill somebody on a field for a sticker. For a sticker. It's not about what it is, it's about what it means, right? That quiet little kid who never says a word. You take, let me see your notebook. You open that notebook, what's inside? Every one of them stickers. Even that kid. I don't care about these stupid stickers. I'm put them all over my face. But you just put them on your face. You're walking around with them. Start the school year off. Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, you do what it is you're supposed to do on this list. At the end of each day, you'll receive one of these amazing dollar store stickers. That's right. I went right to Dollar Tree for these amazing stickers. At the end of the week, you do what it is that we have here. Shiny stickers, y'all. Oh, yeah. Went to Dollar General for these. That's right. I spend the money. At the end of the month, you knock it out of the park from here. Smelly stickers, y'all. Oh, Mmm, yeah, Oriental Trading. <laughs> That's it. That's what I do for you. And at the end of the marking period, puffy stickers, y'all. That's right, puffy. Went to Walmart. That's right, no expense for y'all. And those kids will be like, stickers, yeah, I'm going to get them all. It doesn't have to be expensive, but it has to mean something. Connected directly to what you respect and value. And then the last piece of it is, Reinforce. Reinforce. Now, if you were to go to Google Images, Google Images, and type in the word reinforcement, what shows up are images of scaffolding, framing, rebarb, those kinds of things. It's all over the place. There's some other images, but it's a lot of that. Now, here's the thing. If you look at those images, it's not one metal beam or one wooden beam holding everything together. There's hundreds, if not thousands of them, right? So that leads me to say, you are going to do the first three things, respect, recognize, and reward. You're gonna do them again, and again, and again, and again. And again, and again, and again, and again. You're gonna identify what you respect, value, respect and value again and again. You're gonna recognize kids again and again and again. You're going to provide a reward every time that you say you're going to give the rewards. So this way, when February rolls around, nobody is saying, are we still doing that? It'll be, oh, wow, I'm so glad we're still doing that. And you keep doing that. How many of you, I don't know if it's just me, how many of you have some statement or saying that your parents said when you were growing up, and now that you're an adult, you say the same exact thing, and you can't help yourself? Is it just me? And I hate myself for it. My dad was from West Virginia. You know how many country five things he has to say to me? And I say the exact same thing to my kid. Why? Because he reinforced it in my life again and again and again and again. So if you're reinforcing what you respect and value, you're recognizing them, reinforcing it again and again. You're rewarding again and again. What's the probability of you getting this? It goes up. It goes up. Whatever the results are that you want to see, the probability goes up, and then you can do what it is that you want to do, which is teach. It increases the probability greatly. This thing works. It works. You'll be amazed at how good this is. I've been doing this for years when I was a building principal. Our teachers implemented it. It was amazing the outcomes that we got time and time again. So the question comes to this now. How do we move people through this process and move away from just being compliant and make it so that you're committed? Because this is what we want. We want the kids to be committed to this, right? We want the staff to be committed. 
not just compliant. And in the world of education, we love compliance. There's nothing wrong with it, all right? You gotta be compliant. But compliance is, is, is on a certain level. What are some words that come to mind when you hear the word compliance? What words come to mind? Anybody, just yell them out. You hear the word compliance, what do you think of? Bureaucracy, doing the basics, right? I have to, right? The law, policy, right? Law, policy, regulation, rules, standards, require. And as I said, these are important. You have to have compliance. But I don't know about you, but I haven't, I haven't found anybody who's been outrageously successful just being compliant. Compliant is accomplishment, but it is a low level of accomplishment. You're doing the basics, right? So when you hear the word commitment, commitment, what words come to mind when you hear the word commitment? What do you think? Yell them out. What's that? Caring. Passion. We have to. What's that? Dedication. There we go. That's compliance. Dedication. Passion. Love. Loyalty. Engagement. Agreement. Respectful. Faithfulness. Values. Pact. Promise. So here's the thing. If you can move people from compliance to commitment, compliance takes care of itself. Because we have to be compliant. It takes care of itself. But when you have students and staff that are committed to what you respect and value, if they're committed to what you respect and value, it will happen. They want to see this. They'll make it happen. You're not going to have to worry about that buy-in. So that's what we want to move from. Now, there are some people that are comfortable with compliance. I will hang out in the world of compliance all day and all night. Don't be mad at them because compliance is a form of accomplishment. It's not high accomplishment, but it is accomplishment, right? What's our timeline? We good? Okay. All right. So that's what we want to see. So this all happens through integrity, through integrity. That's how you want this to take place. You want to have these great, amazing outcomes through maintaining a high level of integrity. And integrity, my definition of integrity is a set of beliefs, values, and actions that others can depend on. That's what, that's what integrity is. A set of beliefs, values, and actions that others can depend on. And if you maintain that high level of integrity, it's amazing what you can get out of this. And when you have this integrity, because a lot of times I've heard people say integrity is what you say or do when no one else is looking. It's what you say or do when everyone is looking. So if you have the values of what it is you respect and value, and you're acting them out on a regular basis, that's what people remember. So let me share with you as I wrap up the best way to maintain and protect your integrity. There's four things you need to do. Number one, keep your promises. If you have a promise, you make sure you keep that promise. And what are promises? Promise those your big events, big situations, big units. If you have those big things that are there, you do whatever you need to do to make sure that you keep that promise. And if something gets in the way to prevent you from keeping that promise, you make that up. I promise to do these things, you make sure that it happens. Number two, speak out for what you believe in. If there's something that you believe in, you need to say something, specifically if what you say connects directly to what you respect and value. Because everybody's listening to what you say and they're listening to what you're not saying. Remember, we're leaders, we don't blend in. They're listening to everything. Number three, be fair. Err on the side of fairness. When making decisions, how are you making these decisions? Are they fair? Is it equal? Is it a win-win situation? And I'm gonna go even further with you on this. Not only be fair to everybody else, but be fair to yourself. Are you one of those people just like, just give it to me, I'll do it. Just give it to me, I got it, don't worry. It's easier if I just do it. And now you have all this on your shoulders, all this extra that prevents you from being as awesome and as amazing as you can be. And after a while, remember, a set of beliefs, values, and actions that other people can depend on. Other people can depend, ooh, we'll go to her. She'll take it, don't worry. So be fair to yourself. Know your limits. 
and also be fair to others. And the last one, which I think is probably the most important one, is do what you say you're going to do. Now, I know you're thinking, well, wait, that's the same thing as keeping your promises. No, it's a little different. Do what you say you're going to do or your daily activities, your daily tasks. You say you're going to be there at 2 o'clock, be there at 2 o'clock. You say you're going to follow up, follow up. You say you're going to call, call. You say you're going to text, text. If anything, I think that last one goes more to your integrity than anything else. So you tell me this as I wrap up here. You tell me this. You have what you respect and value in your classroom or in your school. You're trying to move kids from being compliant to just being committed to what it is and others. If you are always keeping your promises, you continually speak out for what you believe in to, as it relates to what you respect and value. You are fair in your decisions with yourself and others, and you do what you say you're going to do. Where's your level of integrity? Way up here. Is the probability of success increase? Significantly. That's what it is. So I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I now have the roadmap necessary to have a great year. I know the difference between culture and climate and how to use it to make the environment better. I have the formula necessary to maintain something through the whole year instead of it fading away in February. And I know that my integrity is what's going to move people from compliance to commitment. I hope I was able to give you something of value. I know that this school year we're not 100% sure what's going to hum of it or what's going to happen, but hopefully you now have what you need to stand tall through it all. My name's Steve Bowler, also Stand Tall Steve, and I want to thank you for your time. One of my taglines is, when you stand tall, you don't think small. When you stand tall, you don't think small. When you get new information, when you get new knowledge, you are metaphorically standing taller. You can't think smaller. You can't think less. And if you do, for shame, for shame, for shame, the information that you receive today, implement it and stand tall. Thank you so much, everyone, for have a great, great school year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Is that?